Just kidding. Are you excited to be here? As always, we're left heavy. That's all right, though. Hey, I want you to do me a favor. I know we already met, but I want you to turn to someone next to you and just, man, just say you're pumped, or if you're not pumped, just lie about it and just say, I am ready to hear something good. And then turn back to that person and say, thank the Lord, it's not up to Chad to say something good. All right. Now we're good. We're all acquainted, ready to dive in. If you have your Bible, you can follow along. We're going to move, like last week, at a rapid pace um, through many verses, so maybe better just watch the screen. If you have an iPhone or any kind of smartphone, there's a deal behind me in a minute, bit.ly.com, bit.ly bit slash UG Live. You can follow along on your phone. Um, you Actually, don't do that. Just keep your Bible. Look at the screen. Let's just do that tonight. Um, all right. I'm very excited. It has been one of those weeks, so... Um, we're going to just pray that the Lord would move in the way that he wants. Um, so I got to tell you something really cool has been happening uh, for the last uh, basically about 48 hours. Um, I, have been, uh, I have been reached out to um, by friends from high school. Now, um, that has been a while. It's been uh, probably about seven plus years since I've heard from many of these guys. And in the last 48 hours, I've had four different people reach out to me. Uh, just to connect and to get together and to talk about what's happening with me and what they're seeing on Facebook. Don't ever belittle what people see on your Facebook because they see it all. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, but it has just been one of those really cool moments that took seven years. Uh, I mean, I've been following the Lord and teaching the Bible for about five now, and uh, no one wanted anything to do with me. My friends, we kind of grew up in a different lifestyle, and so this whole Jesus thing is not for them. But God is doing something really cool, and so I wanted to share that with you up front um, as a, a little reminder of what you post. But also, um, in the midst of those conversations, I got a chance to connect with my best friend growing up. Um, we were best friends. We got in a lot of trouble together. I got him in a lot of trouble. Um, but we were friends. We were brothers, merely. And uh, we haven't talked for seven plus years, and he randomly texted me, said he was in town. Uh, he's 27. He has three kids. And I had no idea. I mean, it was like, what? Multiples of you. Lord, help us all. This is crazy. I mean, it was so, it was so wild. And I should have brought a picture, and I did, and I apologize. I, did, I didn't think that through. But I, I went over. We went and grabbed some food, and then we went over to uh, his mom's place where he was staying while he was in town. And uh, I got to meet his kids, and I kid you not, as I was playing with them, they're just like him. It's amazing the things they do, the way that they walk, the way that their hand motions are. I mean, it's just little Johnny's. And I was just, it's so, his name's Johnny. And it was just like crazy. And he has two daughters and a son. And his son is the youngest. And he just mimics his daughter. I mean, his dad. Everything his dad does. Everything his dad does. He just follows. He's got the, um, the uh, man, on the end hat turned sideways. I don't know how to talk about that anymore. But he's, he's, got, he's got his hat just like his dad. He's got his pants just like his dad. He's got his ears pierced just like his I mean, just a spitting image of his dad. And, and I, I was watching this just unfold in front of me. And as always, you all know, God's so good. I always gives some kind of illustration to just kick everything off. And, and it just made me think of what we've been doing here in the book of Proverbs, like this is it. This is the last week. We've been going for 12 plus weeks strong, and so we're going to move into something new next week. But I just started thinking about how we want to close this, and, and I saw his son and his daughters, but mainly his son, and just mimicking everything his dad did. And I just thought, man, this is exactly what we've been trying to get through to you guys and to ourselves is that this is what it's all about. We want to be able to look up to our Father and say, I want to do and be and say and act and all of those in the way that you do. And that's what the book of Proverbs is all about. It's from a, son, a father written to his sons who will one day be kings. And he is just spitting little, as Frank puts, little tweets at him. Just don't do this. Follow this. Trust the Lord. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. And we've only covered a small fraction of all that's in the book of Proverbs. But I started thinking about this, and I just go, man, there is no better way to close this than to go back to where we started. And it's the simple truth that we should want to be like our Father. We should want to mimic Him and imitate Him. And the reality is, the closer that we grow 
the closer we get to him, the more we become like him, right? You know your friends, right? The friends you're closest with, you start saying the things they say, you start doing the things you do, and you're like, no, stop that, I don't want to do it, but you can't help it. Why? Because when we're around each other, it's just something that happens. Let me tell you something, if you will spend that much time with the Lord, that will happen as well. And you will watch your life, and some of you are already there. Watch your life transform. And so I just want to close us down tonight, focusing on some simple truths. And I really just want to look at characteristics of our Father. I want to close that way. And I pray it's going to be powerful. Um, It's been powerful to me as I've been studying, just reminding myself of who our God is and how powerful um, he is. Uh, It's uh, funny. So Proverbs written from a father to his son. Majority of it from Solomon. There's some other guys down towards the end, but predominantly written from uh, King Solomon to his sons. And uh, it's interesting because um, I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but just think about this. Uh, again, don't raise your hand. Just think. How many of you just grew up without a dad? Just, just think about that. Um, grew up without a dad at all. Or maybe grew up with a dad that just wasn't around, right? And I know a lot of us, I, I had the, uh, the unfortunate and fortunate situation where my dad left early on, but then he came back around in my life, and I'm so grateful for that. He was actually here speaking a few weeks ago. But I remember just thinking in those early days, okay, one of the great illustrations is, is shaving, right? Um, I learned how to shave on my own, and uh, I looked like what you could imagine. I mean, I was all chopped up, little, little pieces of paper. I wouldn't want to go to school because it's so embarrassing. But the reality was I had to learn how to do it myself because he wasn't there, right? And, and we look at this and we go, well, if my dad's not there, how am I supposed to be a good kid? How am I supposed to understand how to live? How am I supposed to know how to treat my wife? That's what my friend Johnny said as he was raising, as he was talking about his kid. It was unreal. He just said, I am not going anywhere. My dad was never there, and I will never do that to my kids. I'm not leaving. And so he said, that's like daddy daycare in Minnesota. He's got his buddies, and if they don't have kids, and if they don't love their kids, they're not his friends. And this is who he hangs out with, and they walk around with, just like in the TV show. I mean, it's unreal. And I'm just like, bro, what a change, first of all, but how awesome, because that's what we need. But the reality is there are some of us that never had that. We never had the Father. We never had the good role model or the good example. And can I tell you something? We have the greatest gift of all, and that's the Word of God, because the Word of God teaches us everything that we need to know, regardless of if the Father was in the picture or not. And then for others of us, one day we're going to want to be dads. We're going to want to be moms, right? Some of us are already there. We want to know what to do, I hope. I hope and pray you want to know what to do. Your kids are growing up in a sick, sadistic world. Man, we've got to fight them off. We've got to protect them. We've got to equip them. We've got to arm them so that we can send them off. I tell my wife all the time, I just don't want to have kids because if we have a daughter, I don't know what I'm going to do. We're going to lock her in the closet, throw away the key because I don't trust anyone. But the reality is the reason I don't trust anyone is because I haven't seen many people do it right. And man, if the world was full of people that did it right, it would be totally different. I'd be sending her out as fast as I could. I'm so pumped. I don't have a kid yet, but hypothetically, I would send her out as fast as I could. And so the reality is, one day, most of us are going to be parents. And we need to know what we want to do. We need to know how to raise our kids. And the book of Proverbs, among many other things, gives us that. So man, even if we didn't have a father, want to be a father, we have an incredible guidebook here. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Basically, what I want you to hear tonight is, if this book and if this God are going to lead us, we should know who he is. We should know him. We should know him in an intimate way. Because let me tell you something. If you open this book and don't know the Lord, it's just going to be a bunch of words on a page. And every once in a while, you may read something that sounds good, but it's just a bunch of words. But man, when he becomes your father, and when you start connecting with this God, all of a sudden, this book really does come to life. And it changes you. And it'll do it on its own. On its own, You don't need a pastor. You don't need a speaker. You just need the word of God. That's the power that's inside of it. So we need to know him. So there's four characteristics I just want to talk about tonight. The first one is our God is holy. Our God is sovereign. Our God is wise. And our God is compassionate. That's where we're going. Four things. It's real simple. This is what I want to dig into. And the first one, our God is holy. Holy means separate. Separate. Set apart. So God is separate. Why is he separate? Because he's perfect. Perfect God and perfect people. Any perfect people in the house tonight? Anybody? One or two? Okay. That's part of the problem right there, bro. Um, That's another story. I'm just kidding. Kind of. Um, He's set apart. He's perfect. Our God is perfect. And honestly, if we could be real honest, because of that perfection... It's in his nature to just, like, he just can't have anything to do with us. His perfection and our imperfection just cause separation. 
And we want to get to him, but it's just a perfect God, and we're imperfect. I think about my mom's carpet when we were growing up. I've shared this a lot. In the summertime, we weren't allowed to wear our shoes. And so when we stepped our shoes on her clean carpet, it was game on, heads rolling. It just wasn't allowed. And it's the same thought. There is this perfect God, and, and we can't be anywhere near him if you look at the truth. He's holy. He's perfect, set apart. Something will never be. But then Hebrews 4, 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. See, what happened is we have this perfect God, and he's up there, and he's, he's here, and we're here, and, and we're, we're his children, but there's separation. But see, he didn't just, and we know the story, right? We know that Jesus died on the cross. That's easier. He rose again. And because of that, we can get to him. We're going to get to that at the end. But I just don't want to leave you hanging there. But the reality is, he didn't just say, okay, here's my imperfect children. Gosh, I love them. I'm going to send a solution in Jesus, and he's going to fix everything. He did that. But he also sent Jesus, and he let Jesus hang out on the earth for just a little while. And while he was here on the earth for just a little while, he did some incredible things. He left some incredible examples. He taught some incredible things that we still study today. He led the way. He came to prove his holiness. While Jesus walked on earth, he never sinned, not once. You guys have sinned five times just sitting here, right? Not one time. He came not only to fix the problem, to prevent the separation but he also came and proved his holiness by walking on this earth this sinful earth being perfect hebrews 4 15 we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness no because he's been there he's done that he's seen it he's experienced it yet he stayed holy and he knows every struggle and every temptation and every pain that you and i are experiencing how do we know that because he walked on this earth just like we did but here's this holy God. We're going to come back to that. Second, our God is sovereign. Our God is sovereign. He is all-knowing and supreme authority. Supreme authority. Without God, there would be no law. Have you ever thought about that? Frank enlightened us on this weeks back. Without God, there would be no law. Why? Because there would be nothing good to base it off of. Think about that. Throw that at your atheist friends. Where... where where does law come from? If there is no God, there is no good. Where does law come from? He's supreme authority. Without the scriptures, who are we? Well, we're lost. The scriptures are our, our path, our protection, our guidance. He's supreme authority. He is also all-knowing. He is sovereign. God knows everything. Proverbs 16, 1 through 4, we're going to throw in a few proverbs here along the way just to close it down the plans of the heart belong to man but the answer of the tongue is from the lord all the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes but the lord weighs the spirit commit your work to the lord and your plans will be established the lord has made everything for its purpose even the wicked for the day of trouble so here's what let me let me break this down for you okay have you ever had to make a decision have you ever tried to figure out what you're doing with your life maybe you're doing it right now where am i going to go to college where am i going to get a job who am i going to marry put that one aside for a minute all these decisions that we're all looking at what do i do how do where do i go god just tell me just give me a sign just if i go like that and you ring back i'll know yes let's make it simple right we want that so bad but he doesn't do it does he so let me break this down watch what happens first we must be moving first we must be moving first we must be doing something okay the plans of the heart belong to man notice it's the first thing the plans of the heart belong to man in essence we should be moving forward we should be productive we should be doing something if you're looking for a career guess what you're not going to find it sitting on the couch you're going to find it getting out and discovering what's out there hey you don't know if this career is for you guess what why don't you get in there Begin to experience it, and then as you're moving, the Lord will be able to navigate, hey, is this a yes or is this a no? And we have this thought that God will just move me into place, and I can just stand and wait, and it doesn't work that way. How many of you have ever tried to steer a parked car? Anyone ever tried to do that? Yeah, cool. If you haven't, give it a shot. See what happens. 
Uh, hopefully it's not because your car died on the side of the road, but maybe that's what will happen. But the reality is it's so much easier to move a car or to steer a car when it's what? Moving. Man, as it starts to guide or glide or however the terminology is, man, you turn that wheel and all of a sudden it starts to move the direction you want to go. Guess what? God works in a similar fashion. Does that mean he can't move you? Absolutely not. God, he could zap you from that chair right now if he wants. He can do whatever he wants. But the reality is God doesn't do very much moving. He does a lot of guiding. And so a lot of us, we're just waiting for these big signs to come. And the next girl that's blonde with blue eyes, she'll be the one I know, so I'm just going to wait until she walks through the door. Guess what? If you're sitting at home, the only one you're going to marry is the postman, because that's the only one coming to the door. <laughs> Think about that. And so it's all about moving, being productive. It's interesting. Sorry, I didn't think that'd be that funny. It's interesting. In the Old Testament times, there were many, many signs that God used to guide his people. Many things all throughout Scripture. That may be an incredible study for you to do in your personal time. All throughout Scripture, God was using signs and moments to say, when this happens, this is where you go. When you see this, go. When you don't see it, stop. Wait. He used all these signs. And then we move into the New Testament, and you really don't see much of that. You really don't see much of it at all. What's the change? It's the Spirit. See, now we're guided by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit inside of us, when we become believers, it comes to life, and the Spirit is what guides us. And so we start moving, and then as we're moving, we go, okay, where now? And this is where the Spirit comes in. Well, what if my Spirit's not ready? Maybe you have that question. Well, guess what? Your Spirit, your convictions, your morals, your guidance, they grow as we grow. So, for instance, when you're five, you ask your dad, can I go outside and play, right? Right? Some of you did, or your mom, or whatever. When you're 25, away at college, do you still call your dad and say, hey, can I go out and play Frisbee? I mean, you could. It's kind of weird, but it's different. Well, see, it's the same process, right? Did dad just change? No, he trusted that you were going to mature, and you were going to grow, and you were going to be able to make some decisions. Guess what? God works the same way as our convictions develop, as our maturity develops. We go and we make decisions. He gave us a mind to use. If he didn't want us to make decisions on our own, he wouldn't have given it to us. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for him, but I don't, I'm not trying to. I'm just saying it just makes sense. Why have you given me the decision? I think because he wants us to use it. But then here's the catch. So now we're moving, and we're using the Holy Spirit inside, the convictions, as we're feeling, is this where I need to go? Is this where I need to go? And then we make that step, and then guess what? The last part is we're willing to let him take the last one. See, some of us, we started moving, and we guided ourselves, and we landed here, and we go, man, this is it. This is where I want to be. This is the only thing I'm going to do. This is going to be great. And then God comes in and says, hey, you know what? The plans of the heart belong to the man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. And so you know what? Looking at this, seeing the bigger picture, I'm going to move you over here. I'm going to readjust you. I'm going to put you somewhere else. But a lot of times we approach life and we're just clinged on to what we think we want or what we think he wants us to do. Everybody hold out your hand. Make a fist, if you can make a fist, hopefully you can. Come on, hold your fist. Okay, see, this is how a lot of us are hanging on to life, right? Just pretend there's, you know, your life. Screen down a little circle there. We're holding on. It's my life. It's going to be great. Power. It's going to be awesome. Something incredible. God is going to do something amazing. And the reality is, if we do this, God can still come in and change, but he's got to pry back every finger. He's got to work through your stubbornness, work through your impatience. And then once it's open, then he can come and say, hey, I'm going to move this out, but I'm going to put something even better in. But see, if we'll proceed life like this and say, hey, you're guiding me and I'm holding it up and, and this is what I see and I'm ready, but Lord, if you want to take that out and totally rewrite it, you go ahead because I'm, I'm ready, I'm willing. You're sovereign, I trust you, you're all-knowing, you know everything. I will never come close. You always know what's best. Have you ever had a moment when you looked back and you thought you were so right, like that was the perfect situation, and then you stepped back, you let it unfold, and you watched it unfold the way you didn't think it would go, and it was even better? Have you ever had that moment? Right? Most of you all, it's your dating relationships. That's a whole other story, but I'm just saying. That's how God is. He sees the bigger picture. He knows what's best, but he wants us to move. He wants us to begin. He wants us to develop those convictions, develop that guidance, develop that relationship with the Spirit, but then in the end, he's going to come and make sure you're on the right path. And this is what it looks like as we move. We trust this sovereign God because he's all-knowing. But we get to participate. What a gift. The third one is our God is wise. 
Our God is wise. Proverbs 3.19 says, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. In essence, he created it all. That's wisdom, right? Let's talk about the human body just for a second. How many of you guys have been in science, studied some kind of anatomy or something, something like that, right? Hopefully you didn't sleep through it. Let me just read you some things. Let's just, let's just experience for just a glimpse how wise our God is, okay? Check this out. Did you know that you get a new stomach lining every three to four days? If you didn't, the strong acids your stomach used to digest your food, that's why we should eat healthy and not unhealthy, another story. The strong acids in your stomach you used to digest your food would also digest your stomach. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for understanding that and putting that in place. I really appreciate that. Because we all want to eat whatever we want to eat, but we want to make sure that it gets taken care of. Praise God. The human bone is as strong as granite in supporting weight. A block of bone the size of a matchbox can support nine tons. That's four times as much as concrete can hold. I don't really get that. I don't really understand it. But that's amazing. Talk about the protection he's put inside of us and around us. This is just a fun one. This isn't about, this is just God being awesome. When you sleep, you grow, this is awesome. Some of you all, man, you're going to love this. When you sleep, you grow eight millimeters. But the next day, you shrink back down to your former height as the cartilage discs are squeezed like sponges by the force of gravity. Isn't that crazy? If you just lay down, you'd be taller, right? It's awesome. <laughs> Couple more. In 30 minutes, okay, we were making coffee today, me and Becca, hope y'all enjoyed it. Took us a long time, all right, like an hour. Check this out. In 30 minutes, the average body gives off enough heat combined, in 30 minutes combined, to bring half a gallon of water to a boil. That's nuts, okay? That's nuts. 46 plus trillion cells in the human body. And last but not least, really the most important thing. Each of us not only have a unique fingerprint, but we have a unique tongue print. Every one of us. You know that? I didn't know that. What does this tell us? Just a glimpse. We're going to study creation in a few weeks, and we're going to get even more of this. What does this tell us? This tells us, one, that our God is in incredibly intelligent. He's so intelligent we can't keep up, right? We can't build telescopes or microscopes fast enough for him to show us all the things he wants us to see. He is wise beyond belief. But you know what else this tells me? That this God created each one of us unique and special. And that's just not some fuzzy phrase we say at church. It's legitimately true. Your fingerprint and your tongue print are uniquely made. There was no assembly line involved. Every person unique this is wisdom we can't create any of that some of us can't fathom that he created that for every single person not to mention the world and the earth and the flowers and the plants and it goes on and on and on but here's the beautiful thing just a glimpse of that wisdom he left here again in this book not only in the book of proverbs but just in scripture alone God didn't just say, I have all this wisdom, and if you can keep up building telescopes, you can have a peek in. No, he filled this book with life-changing material, things that rock our world. Why? Because he wants to share his wisdom with us. You grew up without a dad, no problem, because he's taking care of you. He's got you covered. It's amazing. Our God is wise. And last, our God is a compassionate God. He's compassionate in many ways, but this ultimately happened through Jesus. Uh, when Jesus was here on earth, he showed compassion. He cared for the poor. He led by example. He did uh, a multitude of, he healed the leper. He did all kinds of things throughout his short ministry on earth. He cared, and God used him to show compassion. But then when Jesus left, he left us the example, which we see through scripture on how to proceed. Jesus left, but man stepped in. And God uses us as his compassion tools. God uses people to show other people compassion. He uses you and I. We talked about this a little bit last week. And then the ultimate compassionate move, which we all know and I pray you never take lightly, is that Jesus on the cross. The ultimate, the ultimate compassionate moment. 
You cheated on a test? No problem. Got expelled from school? No problem. Had a kid when you were 16? No problem. Slept with a prostitute? No problem. Drugs, alcohol, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, doesn't matter. No problem. Stole? No problem. Took advantage of people? No problem. Killed someone? No problem. Fill in the blank. Doesn't matter. Tell me something that's more compassionate than that. That I could abuse, take advantage, even murder, rob people my entire life. And yet when I'm ready, this compassionate God says, I'm waiting for you. And Jesus came to earth to live, to be the example, to prove his holiness. And then he died on a cross for us, for you and for I to take all the weight of that sin and wash it away. And you know what's going to happen? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, when you die, whenever that is, today, tomorrow, when you look how sick this world is, I mean, sometimes I just want to jump off the roof now. I would never do that, but I'm just saying this world is sick and I just want to be in heaven. But when the moment comes, whenever it is for you, We're going to stand in front of Almighty God. We won't even be able to, I don't even know how we'll be able to comprehend it. I don't know, but we'll be there. And though we're imperfect and full of sin and made so many mistakes, it was ridiculous. We'll stand in front of God Almighty. And when he looks at us, he won't see you and he won't see me. If we've come into relationship with Jesus Christ, he'll see Jesus. And Jesus will step in. That guy, that girl, is with me. And because of that, because of your sin and his sacrifice, you'll walk in to eternity in heaven with God Almighty instead of burning in a fiery hell. Not because of what you did, but because of what he did. If I wanted to go in to see the president, Hypothetically, I had a problem with everything he was doing. Hypothetically. (laughs) I got in my car. I drove down. I pulled up to the gates of the White House. I said, bro, put your gun down. I don't care. I need to see the man. Let me in. Okay, yes, sir. Pull it in. Got to the door. Bro, put all your guns down. Stop talking in your sleeve. Open the door. Let me in. I walk in. I get to the Oval Office. Secretary asked me to wait. I said, no, thank you. Mr. President, I open the door and I go in. I sit down, say, bro, sir, we need to talk. Could I do that? Would I make it through the state line, let alone the gate or the door or the secretary who's probably packing too, right? I'm not making it through any of them. I'm not through any of them. Unless I'm the president's son. Then I'll walk right through every one of them. And I'll knock on my daddy's door. And I'll open it. And I'll come in. And I'll sit down. And we'll talk. Can I tell you something? We have that same kind of access with God Almighty, the creator of the universe, not even the president, not even close, the creator of the universe, the savior of the world, all of those things he has, and he has given us direct access to him for those of us who choose. Man, I know some of y'all are going, I know this, I've been here. Let me just tell you something, man, we gotta remember this. This should be passion and fuel that burns in us. We want everyone to know because that same forgiveness you have, everyone else needs, desperately needs. Some of you are here tonight, you've never heard this or you've never experienced this tonight. You need this. You need this. This is why we're here. We're not here to entertain you. We're not here to make you happy. We're not here to make you laugh. We're not here to sing to you. We're here to lead you to the Lord so you can start a relationship with him and then turn around and go do the same to everybody else. That's why we're here. But 
before he could consider you his kid, you've got to consider him the king. That's it. You've got to accept it. And upon acceptance, let me tell you what you get. If you ever wondered what the reward was, let me tell you. It's probably terrible terminology, but let's just go. Number one, you're going to get is wisdom and understanding. You will open this book, and it will no longer be just a bunch of words. It'll be life. It'll be bread. It'll be food. It'll fuel you. It'll change you. You'll see his wisdom. You'll get his guidance and your purpose. There goes my car. You'll get his purpose. Can I tell you, some of you already know this, I wanted to be a great football player when I was growing up. And I was headed there, slowly but surely. But God had bigger and better plans, way better plans. But you know when I discovered that was when I discovered him. Some of you are in the same spot. Maybe you already have a relationship with him, but you have not followed him enough to find out, gotten close enough, the song we sing, to find out what it is that he really wants to do with you. And you're walking around like a zombie. Upon acceptance of his gift, that's what we get. We also get his forgiveness of all sin. Gosh, we talk about that so much. It feels like sometimes it just falls on deaf ears. Everything you've done, everything you looked at last night, everything is forgiven if you accept him. That is incredible. And last but not least, you get eternity in heaven with him. What could be better? What could be better? Singing like we sang tonight, and no offense, but even better because we're singing with angels. I don't even know what that sounds like. Mike, sometimes you sound like an angel, just you too, but I don't even know. But it'll be magnificent. You don't just get one of those, you get all of those. And for those of us that already have this, gosh, I pray that you would realize the power here and that you would be someone that shares it. This summer, whatever it is you're doing, I pray that you say, that's the king that I want to serve. That's the reason I'm interning. That's the reason I'm going to camp. That's the reason I'm going to the mission field. All of this, it's not for my recognition or so that my name would be blown up. It's so that his light would be shown through me as I do all of these things. I pray for those of you that have never started this. I pray you've even just got a small glimpse of what he has to offer. And you would look at this and say I want that. I want that to be my king. Maybe some of you are going to baptize tonight. Maybe you've just never been baptized. You've never put your flag up to say, that's my king. Baptism is you going under the water and coming up. And basically what you're telling all of us is, hey, I love Jesus. I'm going to start following him. And I want all of y'all to know that's my king. Maybe you need to do that tonight. Maybe you just need the reminder because you've been going through life and you've been a little stagnant. You've been just a little kind of just all over the place and maybe tonight you just need to say hey look that's my king I identified with him a long time ago but it's time some people really understand that he's actually doing something in my life I don't know I don't know where you're at I don't know where you're... I don't know but I know that God is trying to tell us something tonight even if it's just the reminder live for him some of us find him some of us let the world know that you found him through baptism that's my king and I want you to know Maybe you're going to Bogota. Maybe you're going to the mission field. Maybe you're going wherever. I don't know. But, man, this is why we do all of this. This is what it's all about. It's all about this. A holy God, a sovereign God, a compassionate God, a wise God. That's the God we serve. He's not weak. He's not broken. He's not lost. He knows everything, and he's more powerful than anything we'll ever know. That's our God. That's your God. If he'll choose it.